Um, should we start off? Um, maybe Graham, you want to have a couple of say a couple of words about like I don't know your overall thoughts and impressions about the the debate that you had the other day. Okay, so I think there's two things that um, to draw attention to, or maybe three um, that that I'd like to talk about. One of them was the um, the way that my attempt to work out what the kind of ground rules were, what it would take for Andrew to be able to reasonably claim that he had a successful argument. What, 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 were, what were we looking for? What was he shooting for? Um, and that kind of just didn't go anywhere. He kind of ignored it. And then we ended up at the, at, all the way through, he kept making claims to the effect that because he had a valid argument, therefore he won, which which just struck me as bizarre. Um, so that's kind of one one thing. We, there may not be very much to say about that, but that was one um, aspect of the discussion, which I thought made the whole thing rather unsatisfactory because we didn't have agreement on what the kind of um, the ground rules were. So can I uh, just ask a question about that before we um, whilst, whilst you're saying it out loud? Um, so I got, kind of got the impression that like your thought was like, so what he's going to do is give an argument where it's like, if A then B, A therefore B, therefore I've proved B, um, so that's been established. And you're going to say, yeah, but you know, I don't, I don't buy the first premise. And then he's going to go, okay, well, in order to establish a first premise, here's another argument. And you're going to go, work well, okay, I don't buy a pre second premise in that new argument, blah, blah, blah. And you're going to keep going forever in that way. And uh, um, it sounded to me like you had this sort of cynicism that, at some point he was going to establish a premise that you or make an argument that just ran on premises that you agreed with that you were sort of dubious about that and i wondered because i know you've had sort of a chats with him and well i suppose exchanges email exchanges in the past with with andrew and was that skepticism born out of your previous experience of engaging with him in that way um uh, i don't think it was it had anything to do with my previous engagements with him it's a more mm. general kind of right. theoretical um position so um, the decision to make the topic of the talk, the soundness of the, the Kalam cosmological argument uh, was not mine. I really mm. don't like that as a topic. Uh, it's not clear which argument we're talking about, whether it's the soundness of a family of arguments, whether it's just the soundness of the, the, the primary syllogism. But more importantly, um, as I tried to make clear in the discussion, the question about the soundness, I mean, if it really comes down to what we're going to argue about is the soundness of arguments, then we've kind of got hold of the wrong end of the stick because we should be talking about the truth of theories, not the soundness of arguments. The soundness of arguments is a kind of entirely dependent status. Right? It would be a different matter if, we were, if he was if what we were going to talk about was the claim that, um, you know, the, the Kalam syllogism proves its conclusion, uh, we could actually have, although it wouldn't be a very long discussion, we could have a discussion about that that might serve some purpose. But the, uh, making the topic, the question about the soundness of the argument seemed to me to have kind of got us off completely on the wrong foot to start with. Now it could be, right, in principle, it could be that as we, as Andrew, I keep saying, I don't believe that premise and he gives me another um, proof. Oh, I don't believe that premise. It could be that we'll end up eventually getting back to something where I accept all the premises and therefore I have to recognise I've got some work to do because mm. I, my position's become inconsistent. But um, I I'm sceptical that that's, that that was going to happen in this case. I was certainly sceptical that that would happen in this case. And I don't see any reason why um, sort of at the beginning, you should think it any more likely that that would happen than that if I asked a similar chain of questions, eventually we'd get back to some inconsistency in Andrew's position. Mm -hmm. I think Andrew took himself to be arguing almost from just definitions or something that you had to agree with. He just said, well, by, by beginning, we just mean 
something that you know finite in the earlier than direction or something, and that, that they just rested on simple matters of definition like that. Yeah, so he also, I mean, his talk about the causal principle kind of fitted into that. There was this thing that was called the, the causal principle. It didn't matter that I had an alternative causal principle. That just wasn't the causal principle at all. Mm. Uh, yeah, okay, sorry. So I paused you on the first thing you wanted to say. What was the, what was the second thing? Uh, so the, the second thing was what he called the modus tollens argument. Um, and that so so kind of roughly the way i'm thinking about that argument he's saying look if if um something could begin to exist uncaused then it's possible for lots of other things to begin to exist uncaused but it's not possible for lots of other things to begin to exist uncaused so you can't have anything that begins to exist uncaused and this is an old argument so jonathan edwards had a version of it, you know, things would just, if, if, if the universe could have just popped into existence, then there'd be things popping into existence all the time. Mm. Um, and also something different could have popped into existence. Why a universe? Why wasn't it just the rabbit suddenly popped into existence at the beginning? And why aren't rabbits just popping into existence all over the place? And that's um, Arthur Pryor also did a version of this and William Lane Craig has <laughs> made a lot of mileage out of it as well. That's, so that's the kind of argument that I took Andrew to be presenting there. Mm. Um, and then the third thing, um, something that I um, kind of skipped over in um, reading um, Andrew's book, which I did do, I read it, but I read it a bit quickly, I think, was the, um, the way in which um, he thought that somehow or other appealing to beginninglessness meant that uh, you didn't need to provide um, anything further to account for the existence of the beginningless thing. Whereas the, for things that had a beginning, there had to be some special property that you could appeal to that would explain the beginning of their existence. And for some reason that was completely obscure to me, saying uh, an appeal to necessity was somehow ruled out as an adequate explanation. Mm -hmm. So those, there's kind of three things that stood out for me as things that could do with some more discussion. So I wonder if, because there was a point when I listened back to the discussion today, um, there was a bit that I did, hadn't really picked up on or noticed that much first time round, which was um, he's, he ended up saying something like, well, look, God always existed. So therefore, it could never have been that God didn't exist or something as if he was like rolling together, always existing and necessarily existing. Um, and it was just like, hot that we, well, that just seemed like, I mean, that's just straight, well, <laughs> You could take a, the Hintika thinks Aristotle had that view of something about like a necessary just meaning existing at all times or something, but like, no, that's not normal. That's not the contemporary view. And we distinguish those these days. And it seems to me any argument that relies on collapsing, always existing and necessarily existing seem uh, sort of dubious starting point. So yeah, well. in, the, in the, in his review discussion towards the end, he said that um, he does think that God exists of metaphysical necessity, but that was irrelevant to this discussion and that all that he was inferring from having no beginning was what he called factual necessity. And he didn't mm -hmm. explain what he meant by factual necessity. Um, but I think that the right way to interpret it and the way you have is as something like always. But there is another problem um, here, which is that he was very insistent that um, time begins at t equals zero and the, the, the domain that God exists in sort of causally before is not one that has points or extension or anything like that. That makes the talk about always and the talk about initially quite difficult to understand because that makes it sound like we're drawing distinctions, right? There's a bunch of different 
I'll call them points beforehand. I mean, he insisted there were no points and I was misunderstanding him, but he also kept using vocabulary that's very hard to make any sense of unless you're supposing that there is um, some sort of structure, some mm. sort of differentiating structure there with um, at least a kind of before after relation, which he seemed to be denying was there. So, I th so like you, I found it quite hard to understand what he was saying at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I, I want to bring Joe in because you, you haven't, haven't yeah. said anything yet, Joe. So um, let's look, I'll open up the floor to you. Yeah, well, I guess my major qualm, I guess with the discussion or with his kind of argument was one that you were sort of already gesturing towards Alex, which is that um, the appeal to beginninglessness as a kind of demarcation between God, say, being able to exist uncaused and other things not being able to exist uncaused, or at least not being able to begin to exist uncaused. And so his Locke's central argument for the causal principle, right, was his kind of modus tollens argument. And he says roughly, like, if our universe begins to exist uncaused, then other things would also begin to exist uncaused. And he also, he gives the three reasons, right? The first one was that there would be no cause that sort of delimits things like the universe rather than other things beginning to exist uncaused. The second thing that he cited was that whatever properties that differentiate the universe and other things, um, like either other initial states of the universe or other non-initial things like rabbits and so on, whatever differentiates these things, whatever properties that differentiate them would be had only when they had already begun. And so it can't do the requisite explanatory work. And then thirdly, the, the circumstances are compatible with other things uh, beginning to exist. And he says that given those three facts, right, that implies that there is no difference between our universe and other things, whether uh, initial things or non-initial things, uh, there is no relevant difference between them where beginning to exist uncaused is concerned. And I, I guess that I'm really hung up on this, this demand for a kind of differentiating property in virtue of which the universe or the initial state can begin to exist uncaused, whereas other things cannot, um, because it seems to me that that two quo quay response is going to be powerful, right? Locke claims that there would need to be some special property P, say, let's call it P, uh, that the actual initial state has that other logically possible initial states don't have that grounds why the former state occurred and occurred uncaused and began uncaused rather than those logically possible alternatives. Now P, of course, that same sort of reasoning is going to be applying to God, right? Any property in virtue of which God can beginninglessly or timelessly obtain uncaused would already be posterior to God's already existing, right? Properties are, no matter what, properties are posterior to their bearers. It presupposes the prior reality, as it were, of their bearers. And so per Locke's own reasoning, there's gonna be no property in virtue of which, no special property in virtue of which God and only God, rather than other logically possible beings like Shmad, say, where Shmad has all the divine properties minus something, or where it's, it's maybe some naturalistic timeless being, there's going to be no property in virtue of which God, rather than other logically possible timeless, changeless things, obtain uncaused in that initial timeless state. And so per his own reasoning, um, and we, and we can, per his own reasoning, we'll be able to get that these other things would likewise exist in this timeless, beginningless state uh, uncaused. And that would equally be absurd. And so I think that the two quote uh, objection has some force. Uh, so I don't, I'll turn it over to you guys, see what you think about that. Okay, so, so I'm persuaded that that's a good thing to say in response to um, what Andrew said. Uh, I think there's some temptation to think that he misunderstands um, a certain form of argument if, he th if, if his response to you would be, but that's just a fallacy. Tukokwe is, a is just a fallacious way of arguing. Um, because if, I mean, the way that I understand the kind of objection that's being made, um, Andrew says, there's this problem with your view. And you say, but Andrew, exactly the same problem affects your view too. And he says, no, 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 that's a fallacy, right? Something's gone wrong because uh, either he's gonna have to say, uh, I, I withdraw my idea that that was, a, you know, that this was a serious allegation against your view, or else I'm gonna have to accept that we're both 
in trouble and we both need to revise our views. Uh, he, he can't just say, oh, um, you've engaged in a fallacy. My view is fine and yours isn't. That just seems totally, you know, off the wall. I suppose the third thing to do, I think you either do one of two symmetrical things, right? You either say, you bite the bullet and say, yeah, it does affect my view too. And ta I'll take you down with me kind of thing. Or you say, okay, I withdraw the objection. You know yeah. what? Um, but actually there's a, another thing which would be to say, oh no, my, diff my view is different to yours because of this thing and then provide a relevant difference, like a symmetry breaker or something. And I think Loke took himself to be, I mean, it, it's still, it's not a fallacy, even if you, <laughs> if that's how the conversation goes, there's just not a fallacy in play, it seems to me here, but like, I guess he could have done that symmetry breaker move. Um, I mean, I suppose he does try and do a symmetry breaker move. Maybe we should talk about that a bit more. This is kind of property P stuff that we would. Yeah. Yeah. Well, ago. one thing is that um, I believe because we're using the, this is a, a, a meta point about our discussion itself, but uh, the, the Zoom meeting, I believe, because we're on a free Zoom thing, we only have 40 minutes until it kicks us out, I believe. Um, 40 minute total meeting. So that's something to be aware of. We might just have to start up another okay. one after the 40 minutes uh, expires. But so that, that's just one thing that I wanted to that's say. Because we were waiting for you for so long. It's, your <laughs> it's because of Google. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, how about, how about we talk about Loke's proposed symmetry breaker with respect to that, right? In the comments section of um, Hugh Gidiet, or I don't know how to pronounce it, but his blog post. Yeah, that's, I assume that's how it's meant to be pronounced, Hugh yeah. Gidiet. Yeah, yeah. And in the, in the comments section there, he, he tries to provide this kind of symmetry breaker in terms of beginninglessness, right? And he says that his point is kind of restricted to things with beginnings, right? Uh, it's not as though the property would already be had simply in terms of existence, right? The thing would already have to exist. Rather, he's saying that the thing would already have to begin to exist. And so he's kind of trying to restrict his argument to beginnings. Now, in my view, I think the problem with that is that the same reasoning that he employs, right, as applied to beginnings, that same kind of justification, would equally apply to God and beginningless things, right? I mean, the posteriority of properties and their ability to kind of um, demarcate or ground uh, the uncaused from the cause, whether or not it's beginningless or beginning, uh, that kind of justification or reasoning would apply across the board. The posteriority of properties on their bearers applies across the board. And so even if Locke wishes to restrict his argument to beginnings, I think that the justification that he offers for one of his crucial steps in that argument would equally justify a parallel argument against the kind of beginningless uncaused things, or at least privileging God as the single beginningless uncaused thing. And so I don't think his, his symmetry breaker there works, but I'm wondering what you guys think. Well, I mean, I, I think I tend to agree. I, uh, the way I was thinking about it, I think it's talking about properties being posterior to their bearers is, is a useful way of putting it. The way I was thinking about it was that it's like as a conjunction of, you know, um, thing X exists and thing X has property P. And the thought that Bloke was saying is you can't have property P without existing. So, you know, you can't have that conjunct on its own without a conjunction. Um, uh, but then the idea was supposed to be, well, the, the conjunction together, um, you know, having property P is never uh, on its own. So it's a conjunction, but the other element in that conjunction is just S existing. And a conjunction can never explain its own conjuncts, right? Like, mm. you know, you want to say, why is A and B true? Well, it's because A is true and it's because B is true, right? That's, that's the order of explanation. You wouldn't say, why is A true? Because A and B is true. Right? That's obviously getting the order of explanation the wrong way around. So you want, you know, it, it seems to me that, I mean, it's basically the same point. I think that you can't have a uh, property without the bearer. It's just another way of saying the same thing. You have to have this like conjunction of two propositions, one of which says the thing exists and the other one says that it has the property or something. Um, so I think they're just two ways of saying so. And then if you put it like that, then you just make the conjunction uh, that S exists, uh, sorry, that X exists uh, you know, beginninglessly or whatever. Like it doesn't, it doesn't really make any difference what you put in the, the, the conjuncts there, the point would stay the same. Um, and, and it just strikes me that if that's wrong, uh, then I'm, I'm misunderstanding in a quite deep, deep way what the, the point that Loke was trying to make was. Like I must be completely missing it if, if it's not something to do with that. Um, which might be true, of course, but you know, I'm, 
I don't know what to say about it if, if, I'm, if I'm so far wrong about what the problem was. And what do you think about that then, Bryn? So, I don't know. I'm inclined to just <laughs> agree with what you said. Uh, I'd, I'd ask, what, Joe, maybe to say a little bit more about the kind of posteriority here, and because I've got a feeling that Locke will say, but my thing's beginningless. So how does the notion of posteriority apply? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a kind of either logical or maybe ontological posteriority. So properties in some sense depend on the things that bear them, maybe. Um, they cannot be that in virtue of which they're kind of there in the first place, as it were, even though we're not talking about a kind of temporal ordering, we're talking about an ontological ordering, say. Um, and so I think that his point there, right, I mean, if we're trying to pinpoint a property like beginninglessness as that property, well, that's already going to presuppose the prior, ontologically prior reality of the thing that is beginningless. And hence, it cannot be that in virtue of which the thing that is beginningless exists or obtains beginninglessly, rather than some other logically coherent thing that could exist beginninglessly, uh, like Shema that I was talking about earlier. So that, yeah. that's kind of the thought. Yeah, so, so I think that's important, but kind of my suspicion is that he's thinking that he's kind of equivocating on the sense of priority or posteriority here, because beginning, if something's beginningless, it's not posterior to anything in the, you know, in the, in the yeah. domain in which you've got that ordering, but mm -hmm. that's not relevant, right? That, that point isn't the relevant point, rather the relevant point's the one that you identified about the kind of ontological then an initial yeah. event that priority. begins to exist isn't posterior to anything either. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's not as though its property is comes later, right? Its property is simultaneous no. with the coming into being of the, yep. the thing in question. So they both come into being, its properties and the thing, at the time at which yep. it begins to exist. And so it, he must be meaning a kind of ontological priority. Yeah. Right, but, but, but in that case, your point just... Yeah. There's now no difference between beginninglessness and any other property that he mm -hmm. might have, all of the ones that he thinks you can't appeal to. The beginninglessness is no different from the others then. Yeah, that, that's the thought. Yeah, so if, we, if it's clear that what it's an explanatory order or something, or, um, then it doesn't obviously appealing to beginninglessness isn't going to make any difference because beginninglessness isn't isn't an explanatory ordering property so it can feature any point in an explanatory order in principle right that's why if the problem is about explanatory order it's just baffling to see what the escape route is supposed to be by appealing to beginninglessness um so it's just changed the angle on this so it seems to me that what happens is if Loke may, if Loke gets as far into the argument to develop, to deploy this move and say, well, aha, I can catch you because there's a special property you need to have or whatever. It feels like there's this kind of uh, cancelling out reply, which is, well, you'd need that too. And if we're both guilty of that, then it doesn't help anybody in trying to distinguish between the two views, like which one is right or something. Um, so it just kind of cancels out. But actually, it seems if it's a couple of steps further back in the dialectic here, there was this presupposition that there could have been a different initial state. And it just seems that like if we what if what Andrew's trying to do is a sort of internal critique by yeah. starting points that Graham's going to agree with, then you you can't beg the question, as it were, and assume something that's not true on his view. And and Graham, I'd, I'd like you to just explain and develop this point, but it seems to me that what part of what you were doing was explaining this kind of actualist view of metaphysical modality where all metaphysically possible worlds overlap at some point and indeed they all overlap together at the initial state and, and that's what it means to be you know so if you're quantifying over possible worlds you're quantifying over worlds that share that initial segment so then if you want to and what what pops out of that is you end up saying it you know, it's metaphysically necessary that that initial state exists just because it exists in all possible worlds, right? All metaphysically possible worlds. And that's the theory. So you get on that theory, it's false to say that it's metaphysically possible that, uh, you know, there could have been another initial state. So that this just game over at that point. It is like, you can have a different theory of metaphysical modality, if you like, but you haven't actually scored a point against your theory by bringing that up otherwise. And if I can quickly add something before Graham, Graham responds to that question, um, a lot of people, 
well, I've seen a lot of people allege that this kind of theory is, is ad hoc, but it's really just, no, it, it's really not because it's a kind of Aristotelian or branching view of modality on which all possible worlds share a history with the actual world and possibilities just branch off by means of the indeterministic causal powers or workings of chance or things like that. And it just falls out of a, it's, it's a consequence of the view that whatever initial item, we could mean initial um, by means of temporal priority, or it could be a kind of causal or ontological priority, whatever, whatever initial item you have in such worlds from which you know, the worlds branch, that, that just falls out that that's going to be necessary because all worlds are going to be sharing that, that history. And you know, Alexander Proust has developed this in his work. Rob Coons accepts this view. Um, at least you know, with, with Alexander Proust, his, his initial item is going to be God, right? Where the, the possible worlds kind of branch off from God's causal power, his libertarian free will. But it's a very Aristotelian view and it's not ad hoc in the slightest. And so I, I just wanted to uh, allay that worry that, that some people I've seen on social media and elsewhere allege towards Graham view so i mean it's, it's also basically kripke's view as well <laughs> mm -hmm. to say that it's ad hoc i mean like loads of people like that view yeah uh, yeah anyway right so um the the theory of m modality the way that i understand it doesn't depend on the idea that there's an initial state though the way that i describe it it's just that all the world shares some initial history so you can leave it open that um there might be infinite regress Mm -hmm. And when I presented this view in the talk, I decided to keep things simple that I would just say, okay, my favourite view is the view that I'm actually absolutely committed to. But in fact, I'm kind of a bit ambivalent on the question about whether there could be an infinite regress or not. Um, but pu putting that to one side, mm -hmm. focusing on the view that I would, the one that I said, okay, this is, you know, toast to the fire, this is my favourite view. Yeah. Uh, I'm, it is true that I, uh, it's just a consequence of the theory of modality, which I like on other grounds, that um, the initial state is necessary. Now, we, we can, you, you can have this discussion, and I kind of wonder about um, whether you want to go this way, whether you want to have the Aristotelian view or not. Right? And there are alternatives to it um, that are not altogether dissimilar from it. So you might have a view where you're origin is contingent, but your laws are still necessary. Um, so that you kind of expand the scope of possible worlds a little bit, or you can go woof, all the way up to the other end where basically anything that you can conceive of is metaphysically, you know, anything you can consistently conceive is metaphysically possible. I don't like that view because I think that, um, that you shouldn't run together your kind of metaphysical commitments and the things that you've got that are really just there because of your ignorance. So um, we talk about possibilities in both cases, but I want to make a sharp distinction between them. Other people don't. The people who like kind of conceivability um, won't distinguish between the what I'm thinking of as the kind of the chances, the metaphysical possibilities, and then the kinds of possibilities that like the deterministic dice throw where we say, well, there's six ways it could come out, even though if it's deterministic, there's only one metaphysical way it can come out, but our ignorance means we've got no reason to prefer any of the, the six outcomes if we're going to bet on it, for example. Um, so and I agree that there's a kind of, that there's lots of dis argument to be had about what's the right um, account of metaphysical modality, but I really like the Aristotelian account. And as you've both pointed out, there are lots of other people who do too. And it's not, there's nothing ad hoc about opting for that. Yeah, that's right. And I think it's important just to sort of like have a look over the, the aisle or whatever, and just reflect on the fact that, I mean, yeah, okay. It's true that there it's consistent or there are consistent ways where you can imagine. I mean, it's not like you actually gave a candidate of an initial, but I mean, like you, you could, there are logically consistent ways of thinking of that initial item being different in some some ways right okay fine um but it's also the case that um or you could imagine it right it's conceivable that it's different whatever different types of modality in which you can have a different um initial but but not metaphysically right that's 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 the theory but then you know think about what god is like i mean it it seems not um logically inconsistent to imagine god is a quadrinity or whatever instead of a trinity or just just one one being like a and I think the Islamic view of God is, 
is just one or the Jewish view or whatever. I get basically the normal view of God is, is just one being. Um, so obviously it's not logically contradictory. I mean, only the most extreme people would say that there's a contradiction to be found there. I'm mean, certainly conceivable, right? Other people actually believe that it's true. Um, the Christian position is that it's metaphysically necessary. Right? So that's just to be to say, it doesn't matter that there are logic, other logical possibilities. I mean, if that, if that is relevant, there was a bit where Andrew seemed to be trying to hit you over the head with this. Oh, but there are other logically consistent initial yeah. states. I can imagine, you know, what accounts for, for the reason why they don't exist. I mean, you could just say the same thing, like, but why isn't there a quadrinity? You can't appeal to his metaphysical necessity, apparently. That seems like you don't allow, allow that. Um, so how are you going to explain that um, otherwise, right? At the end of the day, it's just a theory that starts off by saying, I, we just think there's this metaphysically necessary thing. Let it be this, right? Show me what's wrong with the theory on its own grounds, right? Um, yeah, so it's kind of frustrating. Yep. So, yeah. so that's absolutely correct. And I've said in various places in earlier writings that the, you know, my um, Christian interlocutors actually just share this theory of modality typically because they suppose that every world begins with God. Um, there's a question about whether they follow Craig in thinking that the kind of the initial states of God are contingent or necessary, right? There's two different versions of the view and you could have two different versions um, of the view on my account as well. But I think that the better view, even for Christians, would be one to suppose that God's initial state is necessary um, and then to have some chanciness in what God produces. But lots of Christians don't like that. But anyway, there's, you know, there's, a, there's further discussion to be had. But the point that you just made is absolutely correct. Right? The basic structure of this thing is something that um, it may well be that um, your interlocutors accept as well. Okay, well, on that, things I just said something that was right. Let's um, pause and I'll reset up the Zoom so that we can have a look because we've got four minutes left. Four minutes, yeah. yeah. It might as well end on me saying okay. something right as well. That's good. <laughs> okay, and we're back. Um, could have been a word from our sponsors if we, if we had any sponsors, but we don't. Okay, so um, Joe, you're the man with the plan here. You're the guy with the, uh, who did the plan of what we were going to talk about. So where would you like to take us next? Um, I guess the next thing we might want to touch on is this demand for the, the special property and whether or not it needs to be a property of the initial segment and whether or not it could instead be just maybe a global property about the space of possible worlds, say, um, at least speaking loosely in terms of, of property, right? So I guess, I guess I'm not sure why the why that in virtue of which the initial thing rather than other logically possible initial things or rather than other non-initial things coming to being uncaused. Um, I'm not sure why this sort of grounding, this metaphysical grounding that, that Locke talks about, I'm not sure why it would need to be a special property of the initial item or um, I, I'm not sure why it would need to be a special property or some kind of cause that delimits it. Uh, I, I think that there might be other options which Graham was really, I think, gesturing towards in the discussion, but it could have been clarified further. And the other options would be, well, what about the space of possible worlds or maybe a metaphysical principle that, that Oppie employs, right? When he talks about having his two principles that everything has an explanation and all non-initial things have causes, right? Those two principles can do the requisite explanatory work here, it seems to me. They can be that in virtue of which uh, the initial thing and not other initial things or, or and so on, why that, why that can obtain beginning, with the beginning uncaused rather than other things. And also, you know, the space of possible worlds, right? We can just appeal to metaphysical necessity to do, to do the requisite explanatory work, it seems. Um, so I'm not quite sure why um, the kind of conditions that Locke lays out, namely a kind of special property or a cause that kind of delimits it or the circumstances being incompatible with it, I'm not sure why those would be exhaustive. Why can't we appeal to the space of possible worlds, metaphysical principles and other sorts of things? So, so the last thing, the circumstances being incompatible with it, sounds like it might be more along the kind of lines that you're now gesturing towards. So I'm thinking that uh, once you've got the universe up and going, right, um, there, there's no way that things can pop into existence without a cause, mm -hmm. not because of the nature of those would be things, but because of the nature of the universe, there's just nowhere for 
new things to go. Um, right, and so you have this principle that um, that nothing can pop into existence uncaused, I'm thinking, but maybe that's not the kind of explanatory rock bottom at this point. The kind of explanatory rock bottom is something about um, the, the universe is already a plenum, it's already full. So you, you can't get new things in. Now I have a slightly weird paper, the Uncaused Beginnings paper, where I talk about this and think about, you know, why can't it be that a tiger just pops into existence in the room with me right now? And my answer is, because there's no tiger shaped hole, right? The room is full of stuff that's inconsistent with the existence of a tiger, right? You can't, there, there's all this stuff that the sort of from the quantum field levels up, that means that there's nowhere for, that, that there's, given the way it is, there's no, there's no way that a tiger could exist there consistently with how things are. And there's no way that a tiger could come into existence consistently with how things are. You'd need, first of all, somehow to have this kind of tiger shaped hole open up and then the tiger to fit into it. And I thought, even if that was possible, it wouldn't be coming into existence uncaused because there's this necessary condition that would have to be satisfied. You'd have to do the preparatory work of making the hole for the tiger to fit into. Now, I don't know whether that's right. That's kind of weird, but yeah. um, it might be the sort of thing that you've got in mind, right? It's a way of kind of appealing to other stuff. It doesn't matter what it is, tigers, rabbits, teapots, whatever you like, they can't. You, you can't have this popping into existence uncaused because of what there already is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he tried, well, he, uh, he, he uh, attempts to give a response to that in his discussion with, with Swan on the intellectual conservatism video, right? He tries to say that, um, well, it doesn't need to be like a tiger coming into existence of a kind of already occupied room. Rather, like we could just have the fields just, you know, spontaneously and uncausedly increasing in strength, say, or decreasing in strength, or yeah. a whole host of other things. Now. Um, I, I'm wondering still what he means by compatible with the circumstances, right? Because under your view, it's certainly not metaphysically compatible that you have these kind of uncaused, you know, weird variations yeah. because you spelled out your view, right? You gave those two principles on your theory. You talked about how all non-initial events and items have causes and things like that. And so it certainly wouldn't be metaphysically compatible. It might be logically compatible, but then we're back to that point about logical yeah. compatibility, logical coherence and consistency. So, yeah. So I, I, I guess that's all to say that I'm not convinced by his response to your point about occupation, like, you know, the space is being occupied because he says, well, hold on a second. Like we can just talk about, you know, um, the fields is being intensified and things like that. Well, well, no, on your view, that's not actually compatible with the relevant circumstances. So that, that's kind of my response to, to him there. Well, that's part of it. But the other part is that the topic was about things popping into existence uncaused. Yeah, so, that's true. Um, it's kind of you've changed the subject matter if we're now talking about um, sort of these contronomic things happening. But another part of my view is that the laws are necessary, right? Mm -hmm. So we aren't going to get, um, you, you can't have, viol that means that you can't have violations of the laws mm -hmm. either if you're thinking about how the evolution goes. And so um, I'm assuming that it's just inconsistent with the laws that you have these abrupt um, discontinuities in the value in field values, for example. I mean, that's I, another question. Yeah, it's making me wonder what the, like, how does Locke answer this question himself? Um, I mean, on his view, well, I mean, on his view, uh, even contronomic uh, causation can happen, of course, because God could make a field just spontaneously increase in like magnitude or whatever, if he felt like it. Um, but, you know, supposing that he's not intervening to do that, what in what it accounts explains for the fact that that can't happen. Um, it's going to be something about like, well, the laws of physics and blah, 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 and some story about why that can't happen. And it just doesn't seem like you'd lack the resources to, to make the same story. Mm. I'm just not really seeing what like, competitive advantage it, it is it's such an obscure point but yeah, yeah he has even though it's physically impossible still you need to give me another explanation for why it can't happen mm -hmm. <laughs> i don't know just sort of lose track of what the, what the relevance of that is sorry yeah he has he has those sort of three kind of 
conditions or three ways that you could kind of rule this out, right? So the first one would be there, there, there would have to be a cause that kind of delimits the range of the effects that can occur, right? So it was the kind of causal condition. The next one was the special property condition, right? So there would have to be some special property in virtue of which one could do it and not the other. And then the third one was the circumstances being compatible with it. So he would probably take one of those routes. And I guess, you know, one of our dialectical strategies in response to that is just to say, well, hold on a second. These aren't, either of these aren't exhaustive. Um, because you can talk about the space of possible worlds, you can appeal to the metaphysical principles that Hoppe has. So you can, you can appeal, you can say that those aren't exhaustive uh, in terms of our explanatory resources. Or you could say, well, hold on a second, what do you mean by compatible? Do you mean logically consistent? Do you mean metaphysical? And so then you could kind of go down that route. So I guess that's probably how he would respond to your point. He'd, he'd appeal to one of those three. Um, so I mean, one thing is to distinguish the initial case from the non-initial cases, because yeah, I've yeah. told, I've now said quite a lot about the non-initial case. Mm -hmm. But going back to the initial case, you might, maybe there's a little bit more room there because we know, we don't have a, sort of these exclusion problems anymore. The, but um, that just goes back to the to the okay, it just follows. It just falls out of what seems to be a perfectly acceptable. Um, account of the metaphysics of modality, that there is just one thing that can be the initial thing, right? That's the, and, and we, it doesn't seem like we need anything more than the, than just noting that it falls out of the account of modality, right? That whatever is the initial thing has to be, right? That was my, that was my response to Andrew in the, in the talk. Uh, I think that the kind of non-initial stuff is kind of a bit beside the point, though you have to have an account. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here's the, the, the premise of the Movis Tolan's argument was actually stronger than Craig's. Craig, and Craig says, um, if there was a, an initial, uh, it's a contingent initial event or whatever, which again, isn't, isn't exactly the same thing that you're saying, but you know, if something began to exist uncaused effectively, Craig says, well, you know, other things could begin to exist on cause. Whereas really, Locke says would, just, yeah. Would, yeah. <laughs> what? So anyway, it seems that the, the yeah. strengthening of the, con of the uh, consequence there makes it easier to defend against because all you have to do is explain that um, it's not, it doesn't follow that they would, right? I mean, I don't know why, what yeah. dialectical advantage it gets from making a stronger claim that's less defensible. <laughs> so, but we, by charity, we should interpret him to be making the weaker claim, I think, and... Um, yeah, okay. And then, so then discuss I guess that. the thing I wanted to say was that, like, look, um, there is some story you can tell. I mean, some, something you can say, which was what you were just explaining about, like, the idea that, like, reality is full afterwards, right? Like, uh, once the initial event happens, that, that does constrain. Um, there's, there's a branching set of possible worlds, right? But it's not infinitely varied. There's, it's constrained. It's a finite and possibly, uh, at least it's, there's some constraints to it. Like, not, not absolutely everything is possible from that point onwards. Um, but then it's just wondering, like you could say, well, how, maybe, you know, that, that because it's like an actualist theory, um, you can quantify over all of the worlds, like from within the model that you're in, but you could sort of broaden your horizons and say, well, what if I was in a different model of metaphysical uh, necessity or whatever, then if I was quantifying over all of the worlds that go, that pass through that yeah. initial point there, then I'd be quantifying over a different set of, um, histories or whatever that pass through them. Um, and, and I wonder whether, like, is this really all Locke's wondering about? Like, and, and maybe you can just say, you know, in that really wide sense, maybe there are loads of initial events all over some, like, meta-modal world or uh, space or something, and each of them has their own um, possible futures branching off it, because there'd be no observational consequences for me over here. I'm stuck in this world, this set of uh, metaphysically possible world. So I, I shouldn't expect to see pianos popping into existence right next to me or whatever. It, there might be other initial events happening yeah, in some like unmeasurable distance off in modal space or something like, so the, the, then the consequent of the conditional, if that's the, if that's the level of the worry, just doesn't, it doesn't follow that you would see anything at all yeah. as a result of it, right? So sort of so abstract, it has no observational consequences. I mean, who cares about <laughs> I don't know. That's another way of reading this worry, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, another thing that we could talk about was, um, 
naturalistic views on which, because Graham, uh, I know I was t talking with Graham over email and he kind of, he wanted to emphasize further for the audience, I guess, that, you know, his view that he was propounding in the discussion, right, it's sort of, it's if you put his toes to the fire and he's, he's open to other naturalistic views, right? And so one thing that I would probably, or one dialectical avenue that I would approach in this discussion might be because I myself am attracted to a view on which there are no uncaused beginnings. You know, I might say, for instance, that the naturalist could, number one, preserve naturalism's simplicity advantage. Number two, have equal explanatory power compared to theism, so the argument would go, but also diffuse any worries about uncaused beginnings. How would that be? Well, we could just have the initial um, naturalistic being not be uncaused and have a beginning like Graham's view, but it could be uncaused and timeless sans the existence of time and temporal since the existence of time, or it could exist in a non-metric or metrically amorphous time prior to the, the existence of metric time, and then it would exist in metric time since then. And it seems as though um, this kind of satisfies all the desiderata here, right? We don't have uncaused origins. We have finitism, both temporal and causal. We don't have modal collapse because we can say that this thing has indeterministic causal power. Um, and we also have simplicity advantages because we don't have all the extra baggage about God's desires and reasons and his you know, supreme power and knowledge and, and goodness and, and um, intentional power and so on. So um, I'm wondering what you guys think about this kind of, this, this other naturalistic approach that um, Graham might have taken. So it sounds to me that it's still uncaused the way that you described it. So let me, but let me say something else. Um, so I, since the late nineties, I've um, argued in various places that it might be that um, on the best account of our universe is one on which it's not everywhere temporal, mm -hmm. that um, there's a temporal part, but causally prior to that, there's a merely causal part and the kind of idea is that to have time, you need a metric. Causation is not enough to give you a metric. So it happens at a certain point in the causal evolution that time appears on the scene because it's at that point that you've got enough structure, that you've got a metric. And so we can call that T equals zero. And then after that, we've got time. So I'm quite sympathetic to the, um, I mean, you, whether this is a kind of recherche or whether it's actually um, a kind of serious physical hypothesis that physicists entertain isn't really clear to me. And it certainly seems to me that there are physicists who say things in their popular writings that make it sound as though this is exactly what they're thinking, mm -hmm. that, um, that, that time has a beginning, but there's sort of a causal bit before it. If there's a causal bit before it, the kind of question is, <laughs> is there a causal beginning or not, right? Um, because we no longer have metrics, so we can't talk about things. I think we can no longer talk about things like extent and so on. But we, if there's a bunch of different causes, they're ordered, and then we can think, okay, so do we have an infinite regress here? Do we have a first thing? If we have a first thing, it can't have a cause. So mm -hmm. I'm a bit worried that you won't get everything that you want out of this sort of picture the way that you were describing it because you will still have a causal beginning or you'll have a causal regress so anyway yeah continue. yeah no i i should have uh, clarified that um when i was talking about um avoiding the uh, avoiding uncaused i meant avoiding uncaused beginnings right so we don't have anything that begins to exist in the sense that Locke wants ha namely having an uh, a boundary in the earlier than direction right uh we don't have uncaused beginning is in that sense. Um, but we would still, of course, end up, so long as we deny infinite causal progression and we deny causal loops, we'd still end up with an uncaused thing. But I think, I think the, the, the takeaway from that is that um, naturalists, some people will think that naturalists are going to have to, you know, uh, based on your discussion with Loke, they're going to think that naturalists, oh man, they have to accept that something comes into being or uh, comes into existence or begins uncaused. And I just want to flag that, no, that, that's not that's not necessarily the case and that you, you yourself were just kind of, you're offering this as a test. You know, you're, you're going into these discussions with um, like, these aren't your settled, complete diehard views, right? You're, you, if these are, if you put your toes to the fire and you're totally open to these other views on which there are no uncaused origins or uncaused beginnings, but there would be maybe perhaps a, a causally prior uh, either state or causally prior uh, initial necessary being, uh, which is 
uncaused. And so uh, I just wanted to flag that for the audience because I've seen a lot of um, misinterpretations there. So. And so can I ask then as a related question, so if we've got the, the flexibility of Graham's views and see how far it goes. Um, the, so that view you just sketched out there, Joe, was still a view that had um, a temporal beginning, like an earliest point in time, or, or at least fi finite in the earlier than direction or something, way like we put it. Um, so I guess it's just another class of views altogether where um, every world overlaps, um, but that, but it not in such a way that, that um, there is some bit uh, that's present in every world, right? It might just be that they yeah. overlap forever. Um, uh, and I wonder, so that, that view would then be that there is just a regress. Um, and it just goes yeah. back and back um, uh, more and more. Each world, each world would share a history with the actual world, but not all worlds, right? So yeah, because they would each diverge at some point, but there is no yeah. one point at which all of them diverge, right? So that's it's kind right. of like yeah. quantifier shift sort of thing. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right, yeah. And so I wonder then if you could say a little bit, because I take it that your preferred view, if I was to hold your feet to the fire, <laughs> would be that, that there's no infinite regress like that. So we could call that the kind of uh, the eternalist version of your actualism. Um, and so I just wondered if you could spell out a little bit why you think, uh, why you prefer the, the, the view that there's a beginning in time uh, to that type of view. So you're asking me this question. <laughs> yeah, so, well, because I, th I think you could have been asking Joe. So. <laughs> I'll ask so, Joe afterwards, we'll so, see what he says. So, um, just, uh, so it's, it's a kind of weak reason, but on grounds of simplicity. It just, I knew it, it I knew it. Okay, yeah. it's, it's funny because um, Loke, he actually emailed me and asked, uh, asked me to ask you this, Graham. He, was, he asked me to ask you um, why you thought, or why you kind of, if you put your toes to the fire, why you think yeah. that uh, you, you'd, you'd opt for a temporal and causal finitism. Well, I guess just the view that at least it's actually finite, right? And I told him, I told him, I bet it's because it's more theoretically virtuous, it's more parsimonious that you don't have these infinite bloated ontologies. So. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that, that's, that's the reason. It's not because, I think that there's some um, logical inconsistency in supposing that there's um, an infinite regress, or sort of an, 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 an infinite past. It's, it's just because it's not particularly lovely, right? I mean, one way of bringing out that it's not particularly lovely is to think, as we, as we kind of move back, no matter how far back you go, there's still an infinite amount of stuff before that, right? And that's, the th I think, the thing that really bothers people like Craig and Loke. Uh, I don't think there's any logical problem and I don't think that it's kind of, you, you couldn't actually believe that the causal history is like that, but it's kind of not nice. That's, <laughs> that's my feeling. I was talking to my girlfriend about this the other day and she has a PhD in philosophy, but she doesn't... Um, spend as much time as I do one still pondering about these things. Um, and I was trying to explain to her what, what I was thinking about. And, um, and she like unusually sat down and really like, was like, okay, just explain it to me and then lay it out to me. And I, I was like trying to say, well, look, these guys are worried about the infinite past. And um, I think she initially had the, the intuition and I was trying to talk it out of her. But for some reason I was like, at one point in the conversation, um, decided to switch around and was like trying to intuition pump as much as I could. And I found myself like, what's the best version of spelling out that worry that, that these people like Craig have? And I was like, okay, imagine someone who's been counting down for infinity and he's getting to zero just now. But this guy is like breathlessly like five, four, three, two, one, zero. Like he's just saying them as quickly as he can, like one number every <laughs> half a second or whatever. And he's only just finished. And then there's this other guy and he says one integer every billion years. And he's just finishing now. He's just waited 999 million yeah. years or whatever. And he's just saying zero now. Um, but, you know, and then the thought is just, why bother saying them really quickly? <laughs> There's no, it's no need. They've just said the same amount of numbers. They finished at the same time because they've been doing it forever. It's like those two operations are equivalent to each other. And the kind of, your mind recoils at the idea that, that that guy breathlessly running through the numbers for an infinite amount of time could be doing the same thing as the ultra lazy guy who says one thing every billion years or whatever. And I think that's the best I can come up with as a kind of, your mind just doesn't like it, but it's still pretty weak, it seems to me, as a kind of 
and you can just sort of shrug your shoulders and say, well, yeah, it's weird, isn't it? But that, that might be that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and um, there is another part to this, which is that so, there are cosmological models that have an infinite past that haven't been entirely discredited yet. And it was kind of curious. I said at the beginning, let's make, let's keep this really simple. Let's imagine that there's just our universe and that's the extent of natural reality. And kind of about a half, an hour into the debate, Andrew started talking about reasons, sort of evidence in um, cosmology that maybe there's more than our universe. Uh, as if that was somehow going to be a difficulty for me. I didn't really didn't understand what was going on at that point. I mean, if you think about it's like um, Anthony Aguirre's model where you have a kind of background space that's infinite in the past direction, that just, if, if that's how it is, then Andrew's just wrong. All of his arguments against infinite regress just turn out to be mistaken. Anyway, that's just by the by. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we could start thinking about um, libertarian freedom and Locke's argument that um, the kind of uncaused first cause, say, must have libertarian freedom. Um, so, I mean, I guess I can, I can begin with that, this one. So he says roughly, and I'm going purely off of memory here, so I probably should have written this down, but um, it would need to have the capacity to, to kind of prevent itself from initiating that change. So of course it would have to have the capacity to initiate that change originally um, because it's the first cause in the series, but also it would need to have the capacity to uh, prevent itself from doing that. But because, I guess, because it's supposed to be beginningless, is that the, so that there's this period, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not sure why, it ha <laughs> I'm not sure why that second thing follows, right? Why isn't it just that, you know, there's this thing and the first thing it does is it creates right? It's got to have the capacity to do that. But the other capacity sounds weird, unless we're supposing that there's some extended period over mm -hmm. which, right, the kind of thing that would have been anathema to Leibniz, because there's no sufficient reason now why it happens when it does, rather than any of the earlier points when it could have done it, right? Yeah. So, I assume it, so I assume that's not what he's got in mind, but I don't understand the second capacity. So, Although I don't disagree that you characterize what he said mm -hmm. accurately. Yeah, I mean, it might be because like if it, if it didn't have that capacity, then, then the first capacity would like always already automatically be actualizing. And so because this thing is initially changeless and timeless, then it would kind of automatically and sufficiently give rise to something. And maybe that it would ipso facto be timeless. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. I, let me go back to... Uh, I yeah, currently sorry. have, no, no, <laughs> I'm currently going back to his, um, where he talks about this, because I have his slides pulled up right now. Okay. In order to cause an event from an initial change. Can you change share your state, screen and then we can see, and then the audience can uh, see. Too. Yeah, sure. Oh, host disabled attendee screen sharing. <laughs> Did he? What the heck? How do I... um, Okay. If the host knew how to enable it. Um, I don't know how to do that. How do I do that? You could that? also make me host. Okay, how do I do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I think we are on it and you should be able to see it. So, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so in order to have, or in order to cause an event, right, from an initial changeless state, it must have, number one, to be the capacity, or the capacity to be the originator of the event in a way that is undetermined by prior events since it's the first. Okay, so because it's the first, yeah. it's not caused or determined by other things. So it has yeah. that capacity to be the originator. And then it also needs yeah. to have the capacity to prevent itself from changing because then otherwise it would not have been initially changeless and existing beginninglessly without the event or change. Okay, so it can't like automatically be exercising that causal power because then it wouldn't be initially changeless. It would sort of be already changing, right? It would already be actualizing that power, um, it seems. Right. Now, one difficulty with that is that, like, I mean, at least under, under classical theism, right, uh, and, and other views, you can, have the, you can have the exercise of causal power without it making the, the thing being originally changing, right? Like, you can have the exercise of the causal power without undergoing some kind of change. So it could still be initially changeless, yeah. but yet it could still actualize that, that effect. And so 
that's one that's one of my worries right so no thomist is gonna like yeah <laughs> claim that's what it seems like for otherwise the first one i suppose what i'm worrying about is what the framework for capacities is because capacities is another way really of talking about possibilities um right but something having the capacity to um like yeah i guess i'm just not not really seeing it like so the initial event when it's timeless um has the capacity let's say he has to have the capacity to to both be the first cause and to prevent itself from becoming the first cause too early or whatever the the, the idea is i mean how is that cashed out is there a set of possible worlds where the initial event um arrives too early to the party or something and like stops himself stops preventing himself from uh doing that doesn't exercise his capacity to prevent himself from exercises exercising his capacity to start the world or something like i'm just not sure what that really means and again if we're talking about metaphysical possibility then that just seems like it's all sort of question begging and has some theory that um that you're so, not going to so agree to the second one seems better right you can imagine that maybe God just doesn't create. So that's all there ever is, is God. Um, that would be exercising that capacity. So you might think there is a possible world where God doesn't create. The other one's a bit harder though, um, I think. Hmm. I mean, I guess one other thing that I wanted to, to talk about here is like, Okay, so I read his book, um, God and Ultimate Origins, a long while back. Like, it was actually, like, two, two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago. So I don't remember what he said as to why these two imply this. But I guess I'm not yeah. seeing why these yeah. two would imply libertarian free. I don't know. That seems like a really big leap to me. Um, yeah. Merely having the capacity to be an originator of an event and having the capacity to prevent, yourself from, prevent itself from changing. I, guess, I, I don't see why an impersonal thing couldn't have those capacities. I mean, maybe, maybe I just need to read his book again, but I, I mean, I was, I was skimming it the other day. Now, here's what I said. You guys could probably see this now. Um, I'll, I, I said, um, I just think it needs to have indeterministic causal power, I think, right? If the power is indeterministic, right, then there's no need for the entity to have the power to, quote unquote, prevent itself from changing, right? I mean, it seems as though the very nature of indeterminism, right, is such that the initial state or conditions of such an entity are, are not automatically sufficient for the change to occur. Right, the change being its first exercise of causal power to produce the non-initial states of reality. Surely that is all that we need for the entity to be quote unquote prevented from automatically manifesting its causal power and automatically changing. Um, and so, yeah, I guess all, all we need, it seems to me, is just this indeterministic causal power and that doesn't require libertarian freedom. Um, first of all, how many tabs have you got open? That's ridiculous. But also, <laughs> certainly, um, <laughs> um, I think the thought would be, you know, say take some like decay of a nucleus or something. Um, although it's true that there's just kind of open possibilities there that you need to have for libertarian free will. The libertarian is going to say something like, um, when the nucleus decays, that's not something that uh, that action isn't like originated with the nucleus. Rather, it just happens for no reason. It just, you know, just decays and there's no further explanation to that. Whereas when a libertarian agent decide, picks A over B or something, their explanation is, you know, in, or, the, uh, it, it originates with their action or something. It's like coming from them in a way that the, the, you know, the nucleus isn't responsible for it's still decaying or something. I think that's what Loke's trying to build in that like, you know, the first cause has to be like responsible for this thing in the same way that somebody would be if they were picking between options or something. Right. So, yeah, that seems weird to me, right? The structure mm -hmm. of, I mean, if we're just talking about indeterminism, right, and we're supposing that libertarianism is a species of indeterminism, then we have the same structure in the two cases. I'm sympathetic to what Joe says in that case. Now, if by libertarianism, you're not committing to the kind of principle of alternative possibilities, but you're just committing to something like, um, control um, mm. or something like that then that's that's a compatibilist view right we've given up we've 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 moved away from the um indeterminism now but then 
how you got control out of those two conditions, right, is completely baffling. <laughs> well, I was I assuming think... both um, alternative possibilities and uh, to distinguish it, you know, you, you also saying that the, the reason that one of those two alternative possibilities was realized is, you know, entirely explained by the, the thing in question. Uh, but yeah, so that, that, that view, I don't know, now, now we're going to get into the kind of free will debate. That view seems inconsistent to me mm -hmm. because we've, on the one hand, we admitted that, that hold everything fixed up to this point and it can go two ways. And then we said, ah, but no, this, there was a reason why it went one way, right? That just, yeah. It, yeah. I don't see how you can put those two things together, right? So, but anyway, sorry. That's well, I mean, it seems to me that what happened, I think we talked about this before, but the, what happens then is that you're saying, you know, on the branch one, the reason is R1, right? Like, say, say I'm, I'm yeah. choosing whether to have tea or coffee. You know, I like yeah. tea, but yeah. coffee wakes me up more. Um, you know, on that world where I choose tea, the reason is because I like tea. That's what, you know, was my reason. And in the other world where I choose coffee, it's because it wakes me up more. So like it, the reason there sort of accompanies the action, but it doesn't really do any explaining because it's- no, Well, yeah. it doesn't because you've got both reasons in each case. Yeah. And yeah, there was they're, nothing they're, that explained, it which back. was- yeah, yeah, you just push it back. Like why is one reason efficacious as opposed to the other yeah. e reason being efficacious when you have both of them obtaining initially? That, that, sorry, I kind of cut you off, Graham, because yeah. I got no, excited. No, that's right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I don't think it helps. I mean, it, either either we've got indeterminism or we don't, right? If we've got indeterminism, then we've just got this chanciness and there is no explaining why this process went one way rather than the other. Mm -hmm. And that's how, it's, that's how it's always seemed to me. Mm -hmm. right. But so just to take it back to the argument that Lope was presenting there, my feeling is it's difficult to come away from looking at that. I mean, you're just not... You're just not going to accept, uh, it seems to me, it's just not a plausible starting point to say uh, that this thing needs to have a capacity to prevent itself from arriving at the party too soon or whatever. I just don't see, I just don't accept that. It seems very implausible. And like we were talking about before we started recording, I think something about like the distance of the inference from the premises, which is why you were objecting in the first place about like, if we're gonna talk about arguments here, we have to talk about arguments, then we have to talk about arguments that start from premises that are like vaguely acceptable, if not actually acceptable. And there's no point starting with arguments where the premises are just really close to the conclusion, all of which is unacceptable from my starting point. It's just no help talking. Who cares that like one thing I don't agree with entails another thing I don't agree with? That's not an argument that like is relevant to me. I'm just going to shrug the whole thing off. And here it's just like, you know, you can retrospect, you can retrofit some premises that lead you to saying that it has to have libertarian free will, but they just don't seem plausible to me at all. Um, I just don't know why I would accept that thing about the capacity in the first place. As I said, I wonder what the framework could even be, but yeah, I'm sort of worried we're drawing the bullseye around the target after we fired the arrow at it, you know. And we've got two minutes left on this Zoom. Are we going to do another Zoom? <laughs> yeah. Well, See, this that, is that was... That was this a is... very short 40 minutes. That can't be right. I know. <laughs> Does it get incrementally maybe it's, shorter maybe it's, each time? Maybe it's 40 minutes in Google time because Google got me wrong earlier. So Yeah. yeah I mean, this is, this is what's beneficial about Skype is that it's free and you get to do, you get to record however long you want. And Zoom is just like, you got to pay 15 bucks if you want to go over 40 minutes. So I should have been the host because I can just go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> also, neither of you mentioned this to me until now. I would, I would have found. Well, I didn't. Done. I didn't. I assumed that you knew. <laughs> right. You took me for a professional podcaster, and I'm the rank amateur. I don't know what I'm doing. I did ask Joe though, and he is a professional podcaster with a book, and he should have been able to explain it to me. Probably um, should have, but we got less than a minute left. So, how about you send us another link, Mr. Host? Okay, fine. I will do that. <laughs> okay. Sorry, we're keeping you off a bit, aren't we? Now. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, all good. It's half past ten, which is which is fine. We're going for a little bit further. So we need, I guess we need to sort of start wrapping this up uh, in some way or another. Um, how are we going to do that? 
I don't have any kids. <laughs> I covered my main. I covered some of the main points that I wanted to get through. You know, like I wanted to get through um, the libertarian freedom. I wanted to get through the the Loke's claim about logical compatibility versus the metaphysical compatibility. Mm -hmm. We already covered the two quo que. Um, we already talked about how we don't need a special property. It could instead be, uh, you know, a fact about the modal space. Uh, we already talked about. Uh, the symmetry response that, hey, the properties are posterior to their bearers. So I think we covered everything that I wanted to cover. Um, so maybe some final thoughts. I don't know. It's up to you guys. So maybe there's one more thing that we can talk about, which um, I'm not sure that we've covered it, which is um, the way that Andrew kept going back to saying, um, I've given you a proof. Right. Oh. Oh. Right. So... Me. Right, so so what he's done is he's given some very short um, kind of, I mean, it's something that's so short that doesn't even really need a derivation, right? Two premises and a conclusion. And then uh, he says, and so I've proved the conclusion, right? And it was a move that he did quite a few times. What was interesting was in the um, in the subsequent video, the review video that he did, he said at one point near the end, uh, the conclusion's undeniable because the conclusion of a sound argument must be true. Uh, and I, I'm not sure what to make of that, uh, uh, but it's relevant to his going on and on about how he's offered, how he's proved things. He's given demonstrations and you can't deny the conclusion of demonstrations. So I thought it might be worth talking about that claim a little bit, right? So uh, the conclusion of a sound argument must be true. Uh, well, it, I mean, as Leibniz and um, other, other earlier people, maybe even the Stoics pointed out, there is a kind of ambiguity about the scope of the must there that's worth attending to. It must be that if the premises are true, the conclusion's true, yes. If the premises are true, it must be that the conclusion's true, no right? Undeniability requires, you know, the, the, the bad reading, right? When he, when he says the conclusion is undeniable because the conclusion of a sound argument must be true, what he means is the conclusion is undeniable because if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. And that's just not so. Now, I don't know whether this is uncharitable or not, but that seems to be what's going on when he's talking about how he's given derivation, how, sorry, how he's demonstrated things because merely giving uh, arguments that by your your lights are valid and have true premises rarely counts as a demonstration of anything right. so anyway I thought maybe it was worth mentioning that before we before we wind up and there's the the mixture it seems to me I'm not attributing this equivocation or, or you know I'm not attributing this to Loke but it does seem as though uh, when we're talking about it's undeniable because it must be true. It seems as though we're kind of equivocating between the epistemology of things, or I guess the, the rational acceptability of things and the, the metaphysics of things, right? So even supposing that um, the conclusion is necessarily true, right? That doesn't mean that it's undeniable. I mean, like after all, Goldbach's conjecture, whatever, um, you know, mm -hmm. it's either necessarily true or necessarily yeah. false, but it's clearly not undeniable one way or the other. I mean, so, you know, there's still room for rational disagreement even yeah. over necessary truths. And so um, I, I don't know where this whole undeniable stuff is coming from. And it, it came from both of the, the, the participants in that discussion. Like um, Swan used the, the phrase demonstrable at least three or four times, um, where he's saying that there are demonstrable counterexamples to Oppie's theory and that um, Loke's modus tollens argument demonstrates and demonstrably proves its conclusion. Um, so the language there, I also want to flag. I think I'm happier with the idea of a demonstrable counterexample to something because I mean, all, all you have to do there is sort of construct something mm -hmm. that meets some criteria and it isn't isn't inconsistent when it does that and then and you basically do have a counterexample oh um, I'm, I'm cool with demonstrable counterexamples yeah. in general i was just talking about in this context he was taking the modus tollens argument that Locke provided as a demonstration yeah. of um, yeah. uh, the the falsity of Afi's view yeah, and it does seem right that what's going on is a kind of, um, so yeah, something epistemic about like um, feeling super sure about the conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so 
you could have some premises that you're quite sure about, um, but finding a conclusion that follows logically from them, um, the fact that you've got a little argument there and that there's, it's logically valid, it shouldn't give any, it doesn't do anything else uh, to make it more secure than the premises. Like you're, you're as good as your premises and having a, a, a valid argument doesn't help that in any way. But it's sort of tempting to think that Loke's um, sort of ambitious language here is that he's thinking, I've done something additional, I've helped even more than having good premises here by giving a valid argument as well as added some extra credence or something that I can pile onto the top of that. And it doesn't add anything at all. It doesn't make any difference that you've got a valid argument. Um, you'll, st you'll still know, you should still have no more confidence in your conclusion than you just independently have in your premises. In fact, in the lowest uh, and the least of your premises. So um, maybe that's something to do with it. Uh, I don't know. It, it, it's very bizarre. It's a sort of idiom or something that I find very difficult to understand. Um, I mean, I don't, I, mean, I guess I don't go quite go as far as Graham um, on the complete disregard for <laughs> arguments in almost all circumstances. I still quite like an argument every now and again. Um, so, so, so to defend myself, yeah. uh, <laughs> first, first of all, I love reductio. It's a great form of argument. When you've got it, you win, right? <laughs> in the sense that it's now the other person's move. They need to revise their view a little bit. I also think that sometimes setting out um, uh, the, setting out that a set of claims is inconsistent is a useful way of structuring a discussion. Mm. So I really like Brian Weatherson's um, Stanford Encyclopedia entry on uh, the problem of um, uh, the one and the many. The um, so that's not what it's called. You know, the the question about um, how many clouds? That is sometimes called the problem. Prob of the the problem, 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 problem of, of the, the many. many. Yeah. yeah, it's just called the problem of the many. And so he says, look, the following nine propositions are jointly inconsistent. And when we look at the literature, we can see that each of the available positions rejects one of them. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's a really nice way. So, 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 but that's not that's not now thinking about derivation as being used to give an argument. That's the different use of derivation, right? That one where you're kind of structuring um, a discussion in a way that helps people to see what's going on, mm -hmm. right? So, so it's not that I think that argument is, or argument or derivation are useless, right? Because after all, the kind of ground level step that you want is for your view to be consistent. And any argument that shows an inconsistency means you've got, you know, you've got work to do. But I think that in a situation where there's disagreement, where we know that there's prior disagreement, the kind of argument that says, here are my premises, here's my conclusion, um, I give it, you know, and I direct it to you, and I know full well that you don't accept some of the premises. Now you're just wasting my time, right? Because a legitimate response to any argument of that form is I don't accept the premise, give me a different argument or let's move on. Now, you might disagree with me about that, but that's the kind of, I, th I think that it's always legitimate if someone gives you an argument and he's got a premise you don't accept that you just say, okay, we're done, right? <laughs> Give no, me a different I, argument. Well, and he'll say that, oh, well, I, I provided those three reasons on its behalf, but then <clears throat> your, your rejoinder is that, yeah. well, like according to my theory, right, those, those themselves turn out as false. So you're yeah. gonna have to give me some further argument yeah. there. Right? And that, right. that's really where you guys are butting heads in the discussion. Yeah. I, I really almost thought that at that point, it was almost as though, um, and I'm not blaming either of you for this, but it was almost as though at that point that you guys were talking past each other because it's like this conception yeah. of the nature and purpose of arguments. Um, like you can't just say when, when Graham says, I reject the premise that, well, I gave you those three reasons. And you're like, well, according to my theory, those just one, at least one of them falls out as false. And so you're gonna have to give me some other argument for those reasons or show an inconsistency in my view, um, which wasn't given, it seems to me in that discussion. Yeah, so, so I, I think that's a fair assessment. And I had hoped that having a discussion at the beginning about the ground rules would um, lead us not to end up in that fruitless situation, but that's not how it turned out. I thought one of the interesting things about the argument was that so often with um, like uh, theist atheist debates, what happens is you've got 
um, a theist making a positive case and an atheist simply undermining the reasons given that support the premises of that case. Whereas um, what we had here was um, Graham's position really being more under attack than, than Andrew's. Um, there was a lot of like, well, uh, examination of, of, of your theory of modality and stuff and whether or not uh, his objections uh, were successful against your theory. It was almost like the, the opposite of the um, sort of cliche, uh, I'm not taking a position, I'm just denying your reasons kind of atheist on, on the internet. So there is some element to that in the way that he approaches this, though. There's a kind of compartmentalisation. So when he said um, that he really only meant to infer factual necessity from um, beginninglessness, and it was part of his theory that there's that God's metaphysically necessary, but he wasn't talking about that today, right? That's the kind of aspect of the... That, that mm. sort of antithetical to what I want to do. I want to say, look, put all the relevant commitments out there on both sides, and now let's look at them and compare the virtues of the two positions, right? That seems like the fair way to proceed. But he's definitely not interested in doing that. He was kind of keeping all of his powder dry, except for the little bits that he wanted to wheel out in the particular arguments that he was Yeah, making. right. Okay, and that rings a bell really strongly with um, his hotel room builder argument, which is like, if the past was beginningless, then um, God could have made uh, Hilbert's hotel existing today by making one room at a time every day for the whole of the past. Um, but there couldn't be a Hilbert's hotel existing today, so the past couldn't be beginningless. And um, it seems to me what's going on there is that, like you have to sort of forget that um, if the past was beginningless, uh, then like yesterday, there would have already been a Hilbert's hotel because adding one room isn't going to make the difference, right? And of course, Appen's were holds for the day before and blah, blah, blah. And then it, you just find out that, like, if premise two, which says there can't be any Hilbert's hotels, it just is, it, there's no way of having both of those premises true together because there has to be a, you know, you're saying, well, it's possible that God did this thing, which, according to premise two, the impossibility of Hilbert's hotels actually isn't possible. <laughs> it's just, you have to, like, sort of bumble your way through premise one without knowing what's coming next. And then the steamroller of premise two comes in and says, but actually all of that stuff, none of that's possible. So therefore time has to have a beginning. And you just think, hold on, how did we get here in the first place? Did I have to like sort of, you know, play like coy with all of the uh, assumptions and not see them all at the same time? Because if you just see a set of propositions, like is that consistent or not? And the answer is just no. So like, there you go. It's like game over for that argument. It seems like the only way you can get fooled by that argument is by not knowing what's coming. Like the second premise has to be like a rabbit that's pulled out of a hat or something. It takes you by surprise. So yeah, it seems a bit like they're being coy with the assumptions and not just putting them all on the table at the same time. Okay, are we wrapping up? I'm not sure if we are. Yeah. <laughs> we just oh, so so I, think, I, th I think we are. I kind when I did the prep for this, um, I spent a lot of time thinking about the infinite regress stuff because that's what I assumed we'd be talking about. And I wanted to talk exactly about this this question about the, you know, the... Um, so, so when was it possible that there was a Hilbert's Hotel, right? Mm. I'm going to ask him that question, assuming that there's an infinite past, uh, um, you know, how did it, at what point was it, sorry, what, what, you know, what, what, was it possible yesterday, right, that there was, that there was an infinite hotel? Was it possible the day before? Was it possible the day before? Okay, how, how was it that, that God managed to build this thing sort of mm. one at a time without ever doing the impossible thing of making the transition from the finite to the infinite? By his lights, it's by his lights. I mean, I don't mean that that's a kind of objection to Hilbert's Hotel, but by his lights, it looks like it should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And so, well, we had this really cool um, suggestion by a reviewer for that who is po positing the, the that argument in reverse, right? So it's like saying, so you, you start off thinking like, um, could God spend the rest of time destroying one room, like? 
whatever ad nihilum as a you know the opposite yeah. of ex nihilo right um can yeah. you just destroy a room into nothingness every day for the rest of eternity um and uh, and just like with the room builder argument yeah. you have to like set aside the kind of trivial idea that he just like builds a room and then breaks it down and builds the same room again each day obviously yeah. he could destroy a room if he builds makes one again whatever the idea is not that could he just destroy a new room each day forever um and presumably the defender of this kind of Hilbert's hotel argument is going to see where this is going really quickly and say hold on a second it couldn't be that he destroys a new room every day because otherwise there'd be a Hilbert's hotel in the present right um so yeah. they're going to take the move when it comes like pointing towards the future but it's the same move yeah. when you're pointing it towards the past as well like it's basically just completely symmetrical but it's sort of interesting yeah. how it seems to me that there's this like difference of intuition just pointing one when well, you're towards the yeah. future or towards the past so i thought about writing into a paper called eternal destruction just because i like the name of the paper <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so i don't know joe do you want to wrap it up <laughs> yeah no that was a that was a really good discussion and um for i mean i guess for people who want to look more into like the nature and purpose of arguments i did a discussion with graham on my channel it was one of my earliest um one of my earliest videos the channel is majesty of reason and you're gonna have to probably um, scroll down a bit because it's near the beginning. But um, yeah, we, we discussed uh, his, his view on the nature and purpose of arguments in much greater depth. And um, yeah, I, I just really enjoyed the discussion for the most part between um, you and Andrew on, on capturing Christianity. And um, although I did find it frustrating at times, it was uh, very enlightening. And so yeah, that, that's my uh, concluding remarks. Well, I, uh, Cameron told me today that um, it was my fault that um, you were angry with Andrew and that I must have said something <laughs> to you to, to get you to be annoyed with him. And um, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think I did. Um, but then, um, yeah, it was, it was the only time I've seen you even remotely frustrated in an argument, in a, well, in a debate online. Um, yeah, so I, I kind of regret that. But, but <laughs> it, 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 was, it was kind of odd when I um, would say something and then he would ignore what I said and repeat the claim that he'd already made that I was responding to by sort of, the, so, so I ended up correcting him several times on the same point. And it was about there that I started to get very annoyed. Yeah, there was some unfortunate back and forth over whether you, you guys were talking about temporal priority or causal priority. Yeah. Um, that was quite yeah. painful to watch that bit. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's the, exactly the bit that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We've all been there. Okay, good. On that bombshell, uh, let's wrap this yes. up. This has been really fun. Yeah. Thanks very much, you guys. Um, and we'll talk again at some point soon.